Okay, so we're talking about how do we take this set of numbers, which is what happens after the first run of a bubble sort, and bring them over and put them in the initial array, and then run it again, and run it again and again, as many times as it takes. These numbers are slightly better sorted than these numbers, but they're not finished. So what we could do is simply just take these numbers, 1, 4, 2, 5, 8, and then run this uh, sort routine again, basically do one more run through these numbers, doing these selective swaps as necessary. And we'll do that once. And it runs and go, okay, it's better. One, two, four, five, eight. Oh, well, we're pretty much done. But we had to do it manually. We had to take these numbers and copy them over manually. You can imagine if you had thousands of these numbers, that'd be onerous. So there's a better way to do it. And it's this. It's, uh, it's a really handy thing to be able to do in LabVIEW. There's something in it called local variables. A local variable is like a copy or a, a virtual version of an existing controller indicator. The way you make one is just click on the, um, the controller indicator. This is the array control that contains the original array. And I'm going to choose to create a local variable. And I get this, this little virtual version of it and you can change it to read which makes it sort of a control type constant or you can change it to write it's kind of the difference between controls and indicators I want to write values to it so the output right the the results of the array being sorted I'll send here so what's gonna happen is let me put my original values back here um, five one, four, two, eight. I'll make these defaults as well. And so when I run this now, what it's going to do is it's going to sort, it's going to run through this and sort it doing uh, these um, uh, pairs of comparisons and swaps or not. Uh, and then it'll be slightly better sorted than it was before. But then it's going to take at the end of it the data that gets written to this sorted array here is also going to get written to this local variable which puts it back into the original array. Let's watch it. There's it sorted run through once and these values end up here. I'll do it again and these values end up here. Now that we've done it twice, well finally now these are in the right order. Uh, that's fine as far as it goes. We, we sort of lose sight of the initial array, which is kind of a shame. And we have to run this thing as many times as we have to run it. Um, and it's not clear how many that's going to be. Give me a moment, I'm going to go and get a much bigger um, array of numbers. I've got one prepared. I'm going to just go and grab it and uh, copy it over. Okay, so here's the original array. Here I'm pasting a new array that I filled with uh, 20 random numbers. I'm going to delete the first array and replace it with this this new array. It's the same type of thing, it's just got a lot more numbers in it than it used to. 20 numbers to be sorted. Also because um, this local variable now refers to a control that no longer exists because I deleted it, I can just click on it and choose the array 20, the new one that I put on here, and run this again. So let's go and, and try this. I'll show a few more values. Let's run it once. And it runs, and now it's better sorted, but it's still not in order. We'll run it again, and again, and again. And every time we run it, it runs through all of the numbers in the array, doing little swaps of pairs, if necessary, or not. And we keep running it, and we keep running it, and we keep running it. until it's in order. How do we know when it's in order? 
Well, we could just scan through it and check for ourselves, but that's kind of onerous, especially with bigger data sets. One way the program can know that the sorting operation is complete and it's run as many times as it needs to is if I go one of these runs, one of these operations, if I go through and I look to see if this number and this number, if this number is bigger than this number, I'm going to swap them. It's not, so I don't. And I check and see if this number is bigger than this number. It's not, so I don't swap. Then if this number is bigger than this number, it's not, so I don't swap. Because this is all sorted now, I can run through the whole thing looking for pairs of numbers to swap and not finding any. So if I don't swap any numbers, that must mean I've sorted this enough and I'm basically done. So it'd be nice to have some sort of a way of demonstrating whether or not this swap was ever true for any of these cases. Right? This loop is going to run 19 times. Each time it runs, this comparison is going to be either true or false. We're going to either swap or we're not. So what I need is a Boolean indicator that tells me if any of these resulted in a swap. That's a little tricky to do. I can certainly fairly easily put a Boolean on here called swap occurred and if a swap happens it'll light up but the thing is if all I do is wire this here that doesn't do what I want because well what I want to know is in this entire loop in this entire 19 iterations of the loop did it ever swap? That's what I want to know. I don't care which one swapped or how many. I just want to know if swaps happened in this loop executing. Because if even one swap happened, it means that maybe I wasn't done. Once no swaps, once it runs through and every comparison results in no swapping, then I know I'm in order. So this isn't quite what I want. What I want is to kind of take this swap indicator and sort of latch it on, make it stay on if any of these are true, but don't do anything if it's not true. That's a little tricky, but I can do it with a case structure. So if the one value is greater than its next value, that means do a swap. And what I'm going to do is take, again, I'll create a local variable of that boolean and I'll wire a true boolean constant to it. If this is false, I'm not going to do anything. So I have a way of taking this indicator and turning it on, but I have nothing that turns it off. So as it runs through this loop, well, it initially needs to be actually um, uh, turned on. Um, on and then what I want to do is basically demonstrate that it gets turned off. So what I'm going to need is a, a false. I need to take this and initialize it. So what I'm going to do is just wire a false to it on the outside of the loop. And the idea here is when the VI first runs I want to send the false signal to this swap occurred light to turn it off. And then when the loop executes, if even once a swap occurs, it'll turn that light on. Now the only trouble with it is, this is data flow programming. This little piece of code is not connected to anything, so there's no guarantee that this will happen first. It doesn't matter where you put it on the diagram. If you put it up here or put it down here, you can't control when things are going to happen, when data is going to flow by moving stuff around. What I can do here, though, is very sneakily wire this to the for loop, even though I'm not using it. So it means that the false has to send its data, it'll go to the swap occurred indicator, and it'll go to the loop, and then the loop will execute. We call this initializing the variable. We, um, um, we give it an initial value. So let me reinitialize this to its random values and run it again. And we'll run it as many times as we have to until that swap light turns off. I had to do it about 16 times, I think.